Thanks, Dee. So um, I'm Shanqing, and uh, I'm, like Dee, I'm also at uh, Google Cambridge office, and uh, I'm one of the authors of TensorFlow, so we're going to change topic and talk about TensorFlow. So um, I read your course material a little bit, and I gather that you all used TensorFlow in previous parts of the lecture. Is that right? Great. OK, so my focus will be um, how to more efficiently write and debug machine learning models in TensorFlow. So the question is um, whether you need to debug a machine learning model. <laughs> I think the answer is yes. Um, of course, machine learning models are very different from traditional programs. But um, they are software, and they are code. And uh, if they are software and code, they will have bugs. And uh, you need to debug your models from time to time. So hopefully, after this lecture, you will know a little bit more about how to more efficiently debug your machine learning models in TensorFlow. So before we dive into debugging, um, I want to talk about how machine learning models are re um, represented um, in, in a computer, because that turns out to be important for, for how you write and debug your programs. So there are two ways in which a machine learning mo model can be represented. So it's either a data structure or a program. So if it's a data structure, then when you write code to, for example, define um, a layer of neural network, um, you're actually building a graph. And uh, those lines of code, when they're executed, they don't actually do the computation. They're just building the graph. And the graph needs to be later fed into some kind of machinery, some kind of execution engine to actually run the model. And the second way in which you can define a machine learning model is to write it as a program. So that's more straightforward. So those line of, um, lines of code will actually do the computation on either the CPU or um, GPU, depending on whether you have a GPU or not. Um, so the first paradigm is also called um, symbolic execution or deferred execution. And the second one is also called um, eager execution or imperative execution. So um, now the question for you is whether TensorFlow is the first paradigm or the second paradigm. So I heard someone said first. Second? Both? Yeah, so I think it's a trick question, right? So um, the answer is both. <clears throat> so if you ask the question like half a year ago, then the answer will be only the first. But um, in the latest version of TensorFlow, we support both modes. Um, and I'm going to give some examples in the following slides. So by default, TensorFlow is the first mode. So that's the classical, um, traditional um, TensorFlow style. So um, just to give you a refresher of how to use TensorFlow to define a simple model, you import TensorFlow STF, and then you um, define some constants or maybe some variables as inputs. And then you write a line to say, like, you want to multiply x and w. And then you want to um, add the result of the multiplication to, um, to another thing, b. Right? So you can think of this as a very simple linear regression model, if you will. Now, the important thing here is when this line is executed, <clears throat> it's actually not doing the computation. So the multiplication will not happen at this point. If you print the result of um, this line y, then you will see it's not 40. It's not 10 times 4 equals 40. Instead, it's, um, it's like an abstract symbolic thing. So it's called a tensor. And it knows what kind of operation it needs to do when it's actually executed in the future. So mal um, is that operation. It also needs um, information about, it also knows information about like, what its dependencies are, which are x and w in this case. But it's not shown in the printed message here. And likewise, when you do a tf.add, when that line of code is executed, the addition will not happen. It's going to happen later. So by later, I mean a case, um, uh, the point at which you create a session by calling tf.session. And when tf.session is created, it will basically automatically pull in the graph you have already, already built in the previous lines of code. And then you tell the session like um, which tensor, which abstract symbol in the graph you want to execute. And then it's going to um, basically analyze the structure of the graph, sort out all the dependencies, and topologically execute all the nodes in the graph to do the multiplication first and then do the addition next. And then it's going to give you the final result, which is 42. So you can think of tf.session as an engine. So it's going to run the model on CPU. If you only have a CPU, it's going to run the model on GPU if you have a GPU. Now, obviously, um, this paradigm of um, defining a model is not the most um, straightforward, because those lines of code that look like doing computation is not doing any actual computation. And you need to learn a new API called tf.session. So why does TensorFlow do it this way? So obviously, it's because uh, there are some um, advantages um, you can get. So the first advantage is because the model is a data structure. It's relatively easy to serialize this um, and then deserialize this um, somewhere else. You can train your model, and then you can load your model onto some kind of other devices, like mobile devices or embedded devices like Raspberry Pi or car 
or robot. Um, and you can also um, serialize the uh, model and then load the model on like a faster hardware, like um, Google's TPU. Um, so these things are hard, hard to do if your model is a Python, right? If your model is a Python program, because those devices may not have Python running on them. And e even if um, those devices have Python running on, on them, that's probably not what, uh, what you want to use, because Python is, is um, slow sometimes. So I have those links here in the slide, so I'm going to um, send those slides to the course organizers, and you can click on those links if you're interested in any of those topics, like deployments on mobile devices and so on. <clears throat> so the next advantage is um, because your model is a data structure, you are not tied down to the language in which the model is defined. So nowadays, most machine learning models are written in Python, but maybe your, your application server, or maybe a web server is running Java or C++, and you don't want to rewrite the whole stack um, in, in Python just to be able to add some machine learning to your stack, right? So um, if a model is a data structure, then you can save the model after training, and then you can load it into Java or C++ or C Sharp or any of the um, supported languages, and then you will be ready to serve the trained model from your uh, web server or application server. And the other nice thing about um, representing data as a, um, the model as a data structure is you can distribute the model very easily onto a number of machines called workers. And those workers will um, basically use the same graph. They're going to do the exact the same um, computation, but they're going to do it on different slices of the training data. So this kind of training um, in a distributed way is very important for cases in which you need to um, train a model on a very large amount of data quickly, um, the kind of problem that Google sometimes has to um, deal with. So um, of course, you have to slightly modify your model graph so that the shared things, like the weights variables in the model, are shared um, on a server called the parameter server here. But that's basically distributed training in TensorFlow in a um, nutshell. So again, if you're interested, you can uh, look at the slide and can click that link to learn more about distributed training. Any questions so far? <clears throat> okay, so um, also, because you're representing your model as a data structure, um, you're not limited by the speed or the concurrency of the language in which the model is defined. We know that um, Python is slow sometimes, and uh, even if you try to make Python more parallel, um, parallelized by uh, writing multi-threading, you will run into the issue called Python Global Interpreter Lock, and that will slow your model down, especially for the kind of um, computation that a deep learning model needs to do. Um, so the way in which we solve this problem in symbolic execution is by um, sending the model as a data structure from the layer of Python into C++. So there, um, at the la la layer of C++, you can use um, true concurrency. You can fully parallelize things, and that can benefit the speed of the model. Okay. So obviously, um, there are all those um, advantages, but there are also those like um, shortcomings of symbolic execution. For example, it's less intuitive, it's harder to learn, um, so you, you need to um, spend some time getting used to the idea of you, you, you're defining a model first and then run the model later with tf.session. Um, and it's harder to debug when your model goes wrong. That's because everything, uh, every actual computation happens inside tf.session, and that's a single line of Python code calling out to C++, so you can't use usual kinds of Python debugger to debug that. Um, but I'm going to show you that there are actually very good tools in TensorFlow that you can use to debug things that happen in tf.session. And uh, another um, shortcoming of uh, symbolic execution is that it's harder to write control flow structures. So by that, I mean um, structures like um, looping over um, a number of things or if-else branches, so the kind of thing that we encounter every day in programming languages. But some machine learning models also need to do that, right? So like recurrent neural networks need to loop over things and some kind of like fancy um, uh, dynamic models need to do if-else branches and so on. I'm also going to show some um, slides to show those concrete examples. So it's very hard to, uh, it's sometimes very hard to write that kind of control flow structures in symbolic execution, but it's much easier in eager execution. So um, with eager execution, your, your program can be more Pythonic, and it's easier to learn and easier to read. So here's an example. So on the left, you're seeing the same code as before. So we are using the default symbolic execution of TensorFlow. Now, now how do we um, switch to the new eager execution? So you just add two lines of code. You import the eager module, and then you call a method called um, enable eager execution. And you don't have to make any other change to your program in this case. Um, but you will, because of these two lines, you changed the semantics of these two lines, multiply and add. So now instead of building a graph, this line is actually doing the multiplication of 10, 4. And if you print Y, you will see the value. 
And if you print the value of z, you will also see the value. So everything is um, like uh, flatter and easier to understand. Now, um, as I mentioned before, uh, eager mode also makes it easier to write control flow um, dependency and uh, um, dynamic models. So um, here's an example. So suppose you want to write a recurrent neural network, which I think you have seen in previous parts of the lecture before, in, um, in the default mode of TensorFlow. Here is uh, about the amount of code you need to write. So um, you cannot use the default um, native for loop or while loop in Python. You have to use the TensorFlow's um, special while loop. Um, and in order to use it, you have to define two functions, uh, one for the termination condition of the loop and one for the uh, body of the loop. And then you need to feed those two functions into the while loop and get tensors back. And remember, those tensors are not actual values. You have to send those tensors into session.run to get the actual value. So there are a few hoops to jump through in order, if you want to write an um, RNN from scratch in the default mode of TensorFlow. But with eager execution, the things become much simpler. So you can use the native for loop in Python to loop over um, time steps in the input. And you don't have to worry about those um, symbolic tensors or session.run. The, 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 um, the variables you get from this for loop is the result of the computation. So um, eager mode makes it much easier to write the so-called dynamic models. So what do we mean by static models and uh, dynamic models? <clears throat> so by static models, we mean models um, whose structure don't change with the input data. And I think you have seen um, examples like that in the image model sections of this lecture. So um, the diagram here shows um, the inception model in TensorFlow. So um, the model can be very complicated. It can have like hundreds of layers and it can do, it can do like complicated competition like convolution, um, pooling, and uh, dense multiplication and so on. But the structure of the model is always the same um, no matter how the image changes. The image always has the same size and the same color depth, um, but the model will always compute the same, um, I mean, it will always do the same computation regardless how the image um, changes. So that's what we mean by static model. But there are also models whose structure change with input data. So the recurrent neural network we have seen is actually an example of that. And the reason why it changes is because um, it needs to loop over things. So in the simplest kind of recurrent neural network, it will loop over items in the sequence, like uh, words in a sentence. Um, so you can say that the, the length of the model is proportional to the length of the input sentence. But there are um, also more complicated changes of the model structure with input data. So some of, uh, of the state-of-the-art models that deal with natural language will actually take a parse tree of a sentence as the input. And the, the structure of the model will reflect that parse tree. So um, as we have seen before, it's complicated to write uh, while loops or control flow structures in, um, in the default symbolic mode. Now, if you want to write that kind of model, it um, gets even more complicated because there you will need to nest um, conditional branches and the while loops. But it's much easier to write in the eager mode um, because you can just use the native for loops and while loops and if else statements in Python. So we actually have a, um, an example to show you how to write um, that kind of um, models that take parse trees as input and uh, process natural language. So please ch um, check that out if you want. You have a question? The tree is static, right? The tree is static. Yeah, the tree is static in this particular um, input, but you can have a longer sentence, right? This, the, the, the grammar of the um, sentence, the parse of the um, of the sentence can change from one sentence to another, right? So that will make the model structure change as well. So but basically, you can't hard code the structure of the model. You have to like look at the parse tree and then like um, uh, do some kind of like um, if else statements and um, while loops in order to like um, turn the parse tree into the model. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so um, we have seen that the eager mode is very good for um, learning and debugging and uh, for writing control flow um, structures. But sometimes you may, you may still want to debug TensorFlow programs running in the default symbolic mode. And there are a few reasons for that. First, you may be um, using some kind of old code of TensorFlow that hasn't been ported to eager mode yet. And some high level APIs you might be using like tflearn or Keras or tfslim have not been ported to eager mode yet. And you may want to stick to the default symbolic mode because you care about speed, uh, because eager mode is sometimes slower than, than um, the default mode. So um, the good news is that we have a tool in TensorFlow that can help you like, debug a TensorFlow model running in the TF, um, TF. session in the um, default mode. <clears throat> and that tool is called TFDBG, or TensorFlow Debugger. So the way in which you, you use it is kind of similar to the way in which you use eager execution. You import an additional module 
And after you have created the session object, you will wrap the session object with a wrapper. In this case, it's called local command line interface debug wrapper. So um, you don't need to make any other change to your code uh, because this wrapped object has the same interface as the unwrapped object. But basically, you can, um, you can think of this as like an oscilloscope on, on some kind of instrument on your tf.session, which is otherwise opaque. So now, once you have wrapped that um, session, when session.run is called, you're going to drop into the command line interface. You're going to see basically a presentation of um, what, what intermediate tensors are executed in the session.run and the structure in the graph and so on. So uh, I encourage, um, encourage you to play with that after the lecture. So um, the TF debugger is also very useful for debugging a kind of bugs in your machine learning models, which will probably occur. Those are called numerical instability issues. So by that, I mean sometimes values in the network will become NANs or infinities. So NAN stands, uh, stands for not a number. NANs and infinities are like bad float values that will sometimes happen. Now, <clears throat> if you don't have a specialized tool in TensorFlow, it can be difficult to pinpoint the exact node um, which generates the NANs and infinities. But the debugger has a special command with which you can run the model until any nodes in the graph contains NANs or infinities. So um, in our experience, um, that happens uh, quite often. And uh, the most common causes of NANs and infinities are underflow and overflow. So for example, if um, there's underflow, then a number will become 0. And when you use that number in division or log, you will get infinities. And overflow can be caused by learning rate being too high or um, by some kind of bad training example that you haven't sanitized or uh, pre-processed. But um, the debugger should help you find the root cause of that kind of issues more, more quickly. <clears throat> so the TF debugger is a command line tool. Um, it's nice. It's low footprint. You can um, use it if you have access to a computer only via a terminal. But obviously, it's going to be um, even nicer if we can debug the TensorFlow models in um, a graphical user interface. So I'm excited to tell you about a, a feature of TensorFlow that's upcoming. So it's called TensorBoard Debugger Plugin, or Visual um, Graphical Debugger for TensorFlow. So it's not included in the latest release of um, TensorFlow, which is 1.5, but it's coming in the next release, 1.6. It's available for preview in Nightly's. So um, you can copy and paste the code from here, install those Nightly builds of TensorFlow and uh, TensorBoard, and you, you can use the feature. So after you have installed um, these packages, you can um, run a command. So um, all the code in my slides are copy-paste executable. Yeah, so these are about the main features of the upcoming um, tool. So um, if you're interested, please copy and paste these code and uh, try it out. This slide here is just a reminder of the main features in here. Um, OK, so as a um, summary, we see that there are two ways to represent machine learning models in TensorFlow um, or in any um, deep learning framework, either as a, as a data structure or as a program. If it's a data structure, then you will get symbolic execution. And symbolic execution is good for deployment, distribution, and optimization. And if it's a program, then you, you will get eager execution. It's good for prototyping, debugging, and uh, writing control flow structures. And it's, it's also um, easier to learn. And uh, currently, TensorFlow supports both modes, so you can pick and choose the, the best mode for you, depending on your need. And uh, um, we also went over TensorFlow Debugger, both the command line interface and the um, browser version, which will help you um, debug your model more efficiently. So with that, I'm going to thank my um, colleagues on the Google Brain team, both in the Mountain View headquarters and here in Cambridge. Um, Chi and Mahima are the two collaborators with me on the TensorBoard Debugger plugin project. And uh, um, TensorFlow is an open source project. There have been over 1,000 contributors like you who have um, fixed bugs and contributed new features. So if you see any interesting things that you can do, um, feel free to contribute to TensorFlow on GitHub. If you has, have questions, um, please email me. And if you ha um, see any uh, bugs or feature requests about TensorFlow or TensorBoard, you can follow uh, the bugs on these uh, links. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions?